Okay then, it's 10 of all, so we'll start, we'll start now. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Selamat, salam sejahtera, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's tuning in from wherever you are. Very warm welcome to the latest installment of the MOXIS uh, Alternative Energy Working Group. MOXIS stands for Malaysian Oil and Gas Services Council. Um, and this is the uh, the one of the, the at least the second installment of the uh, alternative energy working groups alternative energy dialogue. Today's webinar will be focusing on battery energy storage systems, or best for short, with a focus on the Australian experience. We are honoured to be joined today uh, with Ospreet Malaysia. Uh, we have been working together with Moxie, uh, Moxie AWG to come up with this webinar, which consists of two parts. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of the how with this uh, this um, this webinar has been uh, structured. So the first part will consist of individual presentations on topics pertinent to battery energy storage systems, and the second part we will have a panel discussion going over topics such as grid resilience and optimization. And in the panel session, we also have a special guest from the Naga National Berhad, uh, Dr. Shah. Before we go into the webinar proper, let's go over some reminders. So the first reminder is on webinar etiquette. These include muting your microphone and turning off your camera during the session. And if you do have any questions you'd like to ask the speakers, please type them in to the chat box. Where the secretary team will then pick them up. Now for the second reminder, we'll, uh, that will be given through a short safety video and uh, safety videos on active sitting, I believe. So sit back and enjoy. Throughout history, humans spend most of their time moving about. But now, more and more, we find ourselves sitting, which is not necessarily a good thing. Today, office workers spend hours slouched over and hunched into chairs, moving minimally. Even after finishing work, we continue our everyday lives on the couch. That is, if we're even able to continue it on at all. Despite the spinal, body weight related, and cardiovascular problems caused by unhealthy postures, it's been shown that people with sitting jobs have twice the rate of cardiovascular disease as people with standing jobs. In fact, a recent medical journal study showed that people who sit for most of their day are 54% more likely to die of a heart attack. Even if you dedicate a lot of time to staying fit, the time you spend sitting is still far greater than what's healthy for your body. Even one hour of daily sports can't compensate for 11 hour sitting sprees. So what can you do? Paying attention to your posture is the real key to a healthier life in the office. But be careful, not all sitting solutions are equal. Forcing your spine into a rigid upright position in just any old chair creates more stress on your vertebrae. It's important to know some basics about good sitting posture before you adjust yourself. First, you should consider what type of chair you're sitting on. If you choose passive sitting with back support, then make sure your feet are comfortably resting. Try not to cross your legs. That can restrict circulation. And don't lean far forward or backward. That can crimp your nerves and restrict blood flow. Even rocking back and forth in your chair can help, and recent research has shown that this minor act of balancing boosts your ability to concentrate. Or consider an active sitting alternative where your body's doing more of the work. Just two hours a day of active sitting has health benefits such as improved core strength and burning calories. To get yourself into better shape at the office, you'll need to interrupt your sitting at least once every 30 minutes. You don't even have to do gym exercises to get moving. Get up and do some simple lunges calf raises, and shoulder shrugs to loosen up your joints, relieve tension, and stretch your muscles. Take advantage of every chance you have to move your body. One day, what we think of work will be completely different, and the workplace may well be a far more ergonomic and active place for your body. But until then, you can promote your well-being and boost your energy levels by simply paying more attention to your body during the workday. Thank you very much, uh, Moxie, for that very important um, safety reminder. 
right? It's um, it's, it's definitely something of the either than climate change that we have to deal with today. We also did make sure that we're healthy enough to la to last our lives through this uh, through these times, right? Especially when we most of the time, as is, at least in the in the video has shown that we spend about more than 11 hours sitting down, right? So uh, what you could do actually is check out online, just type down office exercises and you'll find a whole lot of different types of uh, exercises that you could do at, at the office and to practice active seating. OK, then. So now we come to the next item on our agenda. For the opening address, I'd like to call upon Mr. Paul Sander, Austria Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner to Malaysia and Brunei uh, since 2021. He's widely traveled with previous postings in Poland and China, and he has a strong interest in developing trade investment and education initiatives that advocate a public diplomacy element to improve the image of nation brand um, and away from traditional views of Australia that rely heavily on cute fauna like the koala, I guess, and beaches. We are honored to have him uh, for our webinar today to give the opening address. So, Mr. Paul Sander, um, the floor is yours. You probably have to unmute yourself, I think. I have done that, and okay. uh, Mr. Amran, I was just taking a bit of time to do some warm-up exercises following the video. So thank you very much for that introduction, and a very, very warm welcome, everyone. We much appreciate your time today. Can I take a moment, firstly, to acknowledge senior ranking participants from the Malaysia Oil and Gas Services Council, or MOXI. President of MOXI, Madam Sharifa Zaida, Chairman of the Alternative Energy Working Group, our esteemed facilitator today, Mr. Amran Sofian, and of course, Vice Chairman, Mr. Mohan Kurosami. Thank you very much. Can I also thank most sincerely our industry presenters and panelists today? The Government of South Australia, a long standing partner of Austrade, the University of New South Wales, Love of Hydrogen Storage Technology, Energy Wise, and of course, TMB Renewables. These are indeed challenging times. Challenging because we are still dealing with the pandemic, but of course also because of the profound uncertainty um, it, it provides us. It is this uncertainty that is particularly problematic for business, as I'm sure you will all appreciate. Overall, Malaysian and Australian business partnerships have risen to the challenge over the last few years and throughout the pandemic retained a strong focus on maintaining our commercial partnerships these partnerships have been forged over decades and, in some cases, over half a century. In early 2021, Australia and Malaysia committed to what we call a Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, or CSP. That's the highest recognition of our unique partnership, shared values and business collaboration. My organisation, the Australian Trade and Investment Commission, Austrade, is the Australian Federal Government's trade promotion organisation. We can actually trace our history back more than 100 years. It is our role to assist Australian business form long-term sustainable partnerships with overseas businesses and, of course, internationalise their operations. Organize, it goes without saying that organisations like Moxie play a critical role in developing productive commercial relations and facilitating international business. This MOXIE Australia webinar is an initiative of the Alternative Energy Working Group within MOXIE. We are really pleased that Austrade has been a supporting MOXIE, that has been supporting MOXIE as an associate member since 2015. This event and the subsequent events that we will be um, organising in the series will bring together specialists from Australia and Malaysia to share knowledge, experience, and of course, to address areas where more information is required or we're suffering a few pain points. Today's event will focus on Australia's experience in energy storage projects, the costs, the risks, as well as an introduction to different types of battery storage solutions commercially available. This series of knowledge sharing with Australian research expertise and of course solution providers will be scheduled to run in phases, commencing with this, our inaugural event today. In future events, we will look to also include capability in hydrogen, very topical subject at the moment, and opportunities for investment in Australia's green projects. As I'm sure everyone on the call today will appreciate, Australia is rich in energy 
and has traditionally been a global leader in the export of coal, natural gas, and other resources, including uranium. Our energy network has traditionally been powered by significant efficiencies in coal and gas. Of course, new solar installations paired with an ESS energy storage system are becoming the new standard. Unlike many other forms of energy storage and generation, we can all appreciate that batteries are particularly valuable because they provide, importantly, flexibility. They can respond faster than other energy storage or generation technologies and help maintain grid stability by turning off and on in fractions of a second. And of course, that's something new that I've learned myself today. Due to the technology's versatility and gradually declining costs, and we hope will decline further, the use of batteries for renewable energy is expected to increase over the coming years. As I know, you'll also all appreciate, given your knowledge of Australia's beaches and sunshine, Australia has some of the world's best solar and, of course, wind resources and abundant land, making it an ideal location to generate efficient renewable energy. To support grid stability in the transition to intimate renewable resources, Australia has been one of the first countries in the world to utilise large scale energy storage. Australia's potential to generate large volumes of renewable energy has driven interest in the development, of course, of hydrogen fuel to bottle that sunshine for energy storage and potentially <coughs> applications as well. Australia is currently facing a complex and accelerating tra transition to renewable energy. Of course, as I mentioned, we've relied on coal and gas for many, many years. There are currently nine large battery projects operating in Australia with a further 10 under construction, 19 announced, and 37, around 37, proposed projects. Australia's first big battery, the Hornsdale Power Reserve, was built by Nyon using Tesla batteries in South Australia in 2017. At the time, the 100 megawatt battery was the largest in the world, and I understand has since been expanded in size to 150 megawatts. Australia has several research bodies focused on developing capability in energy-related technologies to assist in the transition towards a sustainable energy future, something, of course, we all know that the world needs now. Of course, reducing the cost of solar is an area of real focus for some of Australia's research organisations. That's probably enough from me on a few points attesting to Australia's commitment in battery storage and new energy solutions. This webinar brings together some very powerful voices and expertise in the sector, and I thank you once again for joining us. We hope that this will be an opportunity to meet with Australian experts and learn more about our capabilities, possible joint partnerships, and where we can definitely learn from each other moving forward. It's an opportunity to also facilitate additional meetings with our Austrade and meetings that our Austrade team can arrange for you. Finally, can I take this opportunity to thank once again our friends in Moxie for all the hard work putting this together. To my Austrade colleagues in Kuala Lumpur, thank you, Juliana Budli, Sri Gunasalan, Adil Akbar, and in Perth, a long-term supporter of Australia's energy, oil and gas partnerships, Ruth King. We'll continue to work closely with Moxie on various sectors where there are synergies and potential to form increased mutually beneficial partnerships. Thank you again. Over to you, Mr. Amran. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for that uh, very interesting and at least a good introduction to the topic that we are coming up to, to uh, address today. All right, definitely something, it's a few key points there to, to remind ourselves. One of it, of course, is that there's definitely uncertainty with regards to the energy future. At least, um, at least I mean, to say, in one way, we can say that we've got, a right, we've got a right idea, but we're not sure whether what we're doing is enough, right? And that's, uh, that's where we're moving on towards this. And, um, but the key thing is that working together, uh, the key word to this in today's time will be collaboration with each other and developing partnerships with each other so that we can all work um, at the end of the day we're doing this all for the same planet right so thank you very much paul uh, mr nick smith if you do have any questions for dr kerr please do write them down into the chat box and we'll pick them up later on 
uh, during the panel session. So um, for Mr. Snake, for bit, sorry, Mr. Nick, he's coming from the uh, Government of South Australia and from the Department of uh, for Energy and Mining. His presentation, his presentation will be on the state of South Australia's perspectives on large scale grid battery implementation. I trust this will be an interesting discussion. And Nick is the Executive Director, Growth and Low Carbon Division uh, within the Department of Energy uh, for Energy and Mining in South Australia where he leads the teams, uh, he leads teams which are responsible for capturing growth and economic value associated with South Australia's world leading renewable mineral and energy resources. That is the growth and low carbon vision. He's also the vice president of the International Association for Hydrogen Safety, High Safe, and a member of the Future Fuels Cooperative Research Center's Research Advisory Committee. So without further ado, let's welcome Nick. Ready when you are. Thank you, Mr. Amran. I'll uh, just share my screen and hopefully that will come up without too many dramas. OK. Uh, is that Sorry, in Nick, full screen? Uh, 10 minutes. OK, please. Sure. No problems. Thank is you. Is that in full screen? There we go. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the the, uh, the land I meet on is the land of the Ghana people in South Australia. Um, the Aboriginal people are the First Nations people of South Australia, and I recognise and respect their cultural connections as the traditional owners and occupants of the land and waters of South Australia. Um, so in South Australia, in 15 years, we've had an incredibly good transformation. We've gone from 1% to 62% variable renewable energy in just over 15 years. Um, we're definitely on track for 100% renewables by 2030. And if you if you have a look at that slide on the or that graph on the right hand side there, that's the uh, generation portfolio in South Australia from 1999 to 2021. Or it shows a little bit of 2022 in there as well. Um, but it, it really sort of highlights the transformation, which is the orange is predominantly gas, the brown is is uh, coal, and the purple is imports from Victoria into South Australia. The dotted line down the very bottom, um, the dashed line down the down the bottom is the is zero, and and highlights imports or exports from South Australia into Victoria. Um, and really, in around 2006, we sort of started to see the wind start to uh, our first wind projects uh, at scale start to come into the into the mix. And then in early 2010, 2011, we really started to see solar come in um, as a result of government uh, policies around around solar and feed in tariffs. Um, and as you can see in, in 2021, um, we've, we've actually achieved 62% renewables. Now, to put that into some perspective, um, globally in 2019, the IEA um, did, did a report that highlighted that South Australia in, tw in 2019 uh, was second only to Denmark in terms of the variable renewable penetration of um, in, into the grid system. Um, since that time, as, as you can see, we've gone from 47, 48% to now 62%. Um, so we're, uh, we're rapidly catching Denmark and potentially in the next year or so, we will be in, in front and, and be a world leader in terms of variable renewable energy. Um, to put that in perspective, we've currently got 22 wind farms, four solar fa uh, grid scale solar farms and four grid scale batteries uh, of various different sizes in, uh, in the, connected to the South Australian grid. Uh, we've got two world leading home battery schemes, which are very important, and more than 10 virtual power plants uh, managing the, uh, the system in um, South Australia to, to try and so uh, capture some of the solar on rooftops and manage that a little bit better in the grid. Um, and currently we have a $31 billion pipeline of, uh, of renewable projects under development, including three wind farms under construction, a solar farm under construction. And we've currently got two grid scale batteries that are being uh, constructed, a 10 megawatt and a 250 megawatt um, storage system. So I guess I'll give you that as background because in, in 2017, the former government um, announced that they would uh, build the world's largest battery at the time, which was 100 megawatts. Um, and then in 2019, we're very fortunate in South Australia, we have, we have good bipartisan support for renewables and investment into the energy sector. Um, and the, the current government expanded that by another 50% to 150 megawatts. Now, the, the, the Hornsdale Power Reserve was ahead of its time and, and you know, probably highlighted the, um, by the 
the the text between um, Elon Musk and and Mike Cannon Brooks where they said he'd build in a hundred days or do it for free. Um, but it's been really critical to stabilising the grid in South Australia. In the first two years of operation, it, it achieved $150 million in frequency control ancillary services savings to the consumers of South Australia. Um, previously, they had been provided by uh, large thermal generators, uh, whether they were coal or gas-fired, um, and uh, the battery was just able to provide those FCAS services so much faster. Initially, uh, or currently, it's got 70 megawatts of, reserve, uh, of capacity reserve for system security services in terms of frequency control. And it's got 80 megawatts, which is market facing, which is really arbitrage of energy energy or fre frequency control. And that, that highlights the, the 70 megawatts that's reserved really highlights the South Australian government investment into that battery. Um, the expansion to to 150 megawatts is um, delivering an Australian first, where um, it's it's now um, just commissioning up uh, virtual machine mode, which is really about um, demonstrating the benefits of synthetic inertia and how it can stabilise the grid. So it's been a fantastic experience and really beneficial to to share with people in terms of the knowledge that uh, we've been able to learn from that. Um, and, and I guess this is a really good example. In th on the 31st of January in 2020, we had a uh, South Australia was islanded from the rest of the national uh, electricity market uh, due to weather, bad weather that took down two uh, two tra transmission lines in Victoria that feed uh, that feed into South Australia. Um, and the, the difference in flow really um, caused an impact to the frequency control. And you can see the on the right hand side, the, the frequency is the blue line um, that um, that really spikes spikes there in the at about the 10, 10 second mark after after separation. Um, and the the three batteries that were active in um, in the market in South Australia at the time, it's, they, they are the purple line and it really shows the the speed at which the, the batteries responded to the frequency um, uh, frequency change and how they actually went from, uh, you know, managing the state of, uh, you know, charging to actually absorb that frequency control and bring it back under, under um, you know, a relatively con a constrained situation. And then as it started, as the frequency started to fall rapidly, uh, they started to, um, they started to inject power back into the system so that they could actually do that very, very quickly. Um, this was a really critical um, time and test for South Australia and the Australian energy market operator um, directed them to maintain a, a state of 50% charge and constrain their output so that um, it, it didn't cause any system instability issues. Um, but it really uh, allowed South Australia to operate in an island for 17 days, which is the, that's the longest period that's ever occurred since the national electricity market was connected or Victoria was, uh, South Australia was connected to Victoria in 1988. So it highlights the importance of uh, batteries. And what we've seen in South Australia, in Australia is, is that we've moved from 30 minute um, settlement pricing to five minute settlement pricing in the market. And that's really increasing the opportunity for batteries in terms of revenue. Um, in quarter one, you can see the impact of the, the islanded separation on, on battery revenues in 2020. Um, but in quarter four of 2021, um, the, the, the uh, it was four million. The revenue was four million dollars higher than quarter four in 2020, and really, it's uh, driven by the ability to, to rapidly respond to uh, price spikes um, in under five minutes, um, which gas generators just aren't able to quite do, and and thermal generators struggle to meet that five minute spike, um, which. It, it, it highlights the role and the importance of batteries and being able to respond to to cloud cover over over solar and and um, wind drops in in renewable energy. So it, it's a very important role for uh, and for batteries and they have significant opportunities to earn income. So I guess what's next for South Australia? Um, you know we've got the high, um, Hornsdale Power Reserves world first demonstration of the of providing the battery providing synthetic inertia. Um, we have the Tesla virtual power plant in, in uh, South Australia is looking to expand to 4,000 homes. Uh, and instead of combining solar and batteries together, they're actually now looking at whether battery, uh, battery only is on a house will actually play a, a, um, 
or be a, uh, a feasible um, financially um, for, for consumers. Um, we've just announced the, fi um, the commencement of uh, 536 statewide electric vehicle charging um, systems around South Australia, and we have a whole range of smart charging trials underway, which um, will encourage con uh, electric vehicles to only charge when there's excess renewables or where there's um, very, very uh, low pricing to absorb all of the um, excess renewables that we have in the system. To stimulate electric vehicle update, we've also um, got $3,000 subsidy and three-year registration exemption for up to 7,000 electric vehicles. Uh, we do have Australia's largest green hydrogen electrolyzer um, operational in, in South Australia. Um, that's now sort of injecting about 5% blend into the network. And then we also have a, 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 a gigawatt scale hydrogen export hub at Port Benython, which is uh, really going to test the flexibility of the, the um, electrolyzers in terms of also managing the, the variable renewable energy side of things. So thank you very much for your time. Um, hopefully I've, uh, I've provided a good presentation of the importance of batteries in the system and uh, I, uh, I look forward to being able to speak to you a little bit later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, definitely very inspiring to learn about uh, the South Australian government's uh, um, experience with regards to implementation of the Alaska grid battery. I'm sure there might be some questions coming up for you soon. However, we've got to move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much, Nick. We'll catch up uh, on the, in the panel session. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Amir Rathor, the director of the Asia Pacific um, and government relations of LAVO the Hydrogen Storage Technology Limited. He's responsible for green hydrogen supply chain strategic business development between Australia and Asia Pacific energy industry and management determines the management of corporate investments and government funding into energy storage projects in commercialization and solid state metal hydride hydrogen storage systems so this is a quite an interesting uh, technology uh, i've just recently read about it in a small booklet from wired by um, lavo itself and i'm um, looking forward to hear your presentation i mean go ahead Hello everyone, thank you very much for your time. Emma Rothor here from Lavo Hydrogen Storage Technologies. As the name suggests, uh, we are in hydrogen storage technology, uh, maybe metal hydride specifically. So um, as a company introduction, um, I'll start with our uh, with the background of our company, which is the Providence Asset Group, a venture capital firm uh, and um, we are working on clean investments uh, uh, in renewable energy. Uh, we have about 45 megawatt solar farms operational across Australia, regional Australia, spread across Victoria and New South Wales. And uh, their battery storage uh, on these solar farms, uh, and we are adding metal hydride hydrogen storage to uh, the so-called long duration storage solution. So uh, the total asset is about one billion dollars portfolio for both companies and uh if you come to sorry uh about lavo uh we're focusing on the uh applications for hydrogen storage and the devices the commercialization so the original technology it took about nine years working together with the unsw uh we have some colleagues here from unsw as well today and uh, I was engaged with UNSW Hydrogen Research Center for about four years uh, before joining LAVO. So it's uh, original uh, Australian IP technology and their uh, metal hydride is not new, but uh, the way we have brought us, this to the market and there's some di key differentiators from the current metal hydride in the market. So I'll begin with the devices that we have started production and Australian government has been very helpful and uh, you know supportive to us in terms of funding and uh, bringing this product to the market and to the mass production. So the device you see actually is, uh, is a battery, we can call it an all-in-one battery. It has uh, a built-in electrolyzer and fuel cell up and power stabilizing system, um, voltage regulation system. It has a DC 48 volt output and um, the capacity is 40 kilowatt hours. 
which can continuously charge. Further, the metal hydride has 20,000 charge discharge cycles minimum before it starts to degrade, and the metal hydride inside is 100% uh, recyclable. So that's uh, the product that has been brought to the market. There was a um, there was a news uh, last week uh, uh, that we have started mass production. Paul Tool was there, who's the um, he's, he's the minister for regional Australia, and uh, so he announced that uh, we have launched a full scale mass production in the Hunter region for these devices. So talking about the, I think most of the our audience is would be familiar with the hydrogen storage technology in metal hydride. So um, where, where does it differentiate from other technologies? Uh, obviously, hydrogen is abundantly millions of tons of hydrogen is used around across the world. Obviously, mostly is coming from steam methane deforming or other forms of hydrogen. Could be MCH or others. Uh, but we simply compare uh, the metal hydride here in um, with liquefied hydrogen and pressurized hydrogen. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Just, just a quick one. There seems to be a gray box on the left hand, sorry, right hand corner of the slide. Not sure what this box is. Uh, are you seeing the same thing on your side? Uh, no, I, I see just uh, my screen. Oh, okay, okay. Well, uh, maybe to try, try, try resharing your screen because it seems that there's a gray box here. Not sure what it is. It could be a bandwidth. Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, everyone. Just, just to make sure that the slides are all okay, so that you all can see. Yeah. Sorry, Amir. Uh, no, no problem. I'll bring it up again. Okay. Is this? Any better now? Clear? Or? Mm, still seems to be there though. Um, not sure what it is. It's, is it a, a prompt? Uh, it's okay. I think you just just proceed. I guess I, I'm not sure what what that box is. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All prompt? right. Go ahead then. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the screen you see now uh, is the is is the comparison of different technologies. So um, we talk about energy density. Uh, metal hydride obviously has a lot of uh, higher energy density, about twice as compared to the pressurized hydrogen. And uh, the and the pressure at which it stores hydrogen is about 30 bar, as compared to the pressurized hydrogen, the compressed hydrogen, which is 700 bar. So there's a huge difference in pressure, and that also talks about the safety. Uh, storage efficiency, there's virtually m minimal leaks uh, in storage um, or heat losses. So the efficiency is quite high for metal hydride. And as I mentioned, there are 20,000 cycles of charging and discharging of metal hydride as compared to uh, the limited cycles of lithium ion battery. So our objective is what we're trying to achieve in uh, our projects in Australia is a combination for, for good firming and um, peak shaving applications. We are trying to secure long-term storage uh, by using metal hydride in combination with smaller size lithium ion battery because and as it was mentioned before in this presentation that uh, for fast frequency response, um, lithium ion batteries are ideal, but when it comes to long duration supply and grid uh, firming for longer duration, uh, either a flow, we can go with flow batteries, which are more or less toxic and a, a bit of an issue, or we can go with hydrogen power. So this this is what we're trying to achieve uh, using hydrogen power. Th this is the device, the diagram of the battery, which is a uh, 40 kilowatt hour output, and it has, a, as I mentioned, a built-in electrolyzer, a uh, fuel cell, and uh, it has a small lithium ion battery for uh, faster frequency response. The red vessels that you see here are is are filled with metal hydride. So um, the hydrogen is produced by the electrolyzer, 
and it, it gets stored into these um, metal hydride vessels. Uh, output is DC or N. Sorry. And uh, it can simply be connected to the um, to the rooftop solar and uh, a hybrid inverter. And you can power uh, either home or industry or the applications we are looking very closely into, or there's a lot of interest from the telecommunication industry for the towers, um, where they're trying to get uh, less dependency on the diesel generator sets and to reduce their battery size, because that's the biggest expense for the telcos, uh, which is the supply of diesel and the problems with the diesel, the carbon footprint and all that. So this seems to be a solution and we are getting worldwide interest for telecom applications for this device. It is 48 volt DC, which is perfect for telecom load, which is always uh, 48 volt DC. And it simply plugs into the DC bus, which already has several um, systems uh, feeding into the load. The other applications for the metal hydride is we are trying to standardize the um, the so-called, we call it UPV, universal um, charge vessels, which can be um, filled with metal hydride. I mean, uh, they, they're already filled with metal hydride and we just charge them with the hydrogen. Hydrogen is stored into these vessels and it can be used in a, for example, in a barbecue, a standardization of the market of the future or it can be plugged in a bicycle. So we are working with the design companies who do barbecue or bicycles, or the number of applications for metal hydride in the future, which may even replace lithium ion batteries because there's virtually no uh, environmental problem with the metal hydride we're using. It's 100% recyclable and there's no negative environmental impact. The next is uh, the application of the same metal hydride in a, in a large scale form. Uh, so this, the container that is on the screen, it's a 20 foot half height shipping container. Uh, it has uh, long hydrogen vessels inside and it can carry up to 400 kilograms of hydrogen, which is equivalent to like 13 megawatt hour of electrical power. But obviously there will be losses it depends what application we use this for. It can, uh, it does not require special ships or special trucks or special tube trailers with a high um, pressurized hydrogen. Um, we, this, this is compliant with a, um, a national maritime organization standards. Can be just put on the back of a truck, like a truck trailer, and can be brought anywhere to um, a refueling station. We can do refueling station or um, telecom mining remote area where the power is needed, um, as I mentioned, hydrogen refueling station, and most importantly, the, uh, the grid firming, uh, where there's a combination of lithium ion battery and this metal hydride storage. So this diagram shows uh, what we are doing in Victoria um, on our uh, solar farms. We have here we have renewable energy source, which is like for this example, five megawatt solar farm, uh, which is running an electrolyzer. The electrolyzer is obviously producing 99.99% pure hydrogen, which is being green hydrogen, which is being stored into this uh, shipping container. Now we can ship this container directly uh, from the solar farm, for example, uh, or in some cases, we've done a project in UK, where the, there's a lot of coastal winds coming so we can connect electrolyzer directly to the grid. If the grid has already been green power is injected into the grid, then we don't really need a solar farm. So depending on the country and the application, we can always generate green hydrogen. Um, so the, the objective really here is, you know, we can supply it to the market, the green hydrogen in these containers, or we can connect to the, to the fuel cell and uh, the best battery energy storage system. So there's a hydrogen energy storage system and there's a battery energy storage system and connect to the grid uh, with this um, infrastructure. 
So yeah, that's um, that's all for my presentation. Uh, we welcome any questions, comments, and further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amir, for the presentation on LAVO and for the uh, on the metal hydride system. Uh, most interesting. I'm sure there might be some questions coming up. Either they can write it down in the chat box or probably contact you um, directly later on. Okay, so now we're on to our last speaker for the first part of our webinar, which we have uh, Mike, Mr. Michael Harris. He's the Chief Technical Officer of EnergyWise Meetingwise Limited, development of an advanced battery solution coupled with ELP microgrid technology. Uh, which is able to deliver reliable solutions for sustainable power in locations where distribution is and resources for fire electricians is scarce. So, uh, without further ado, then, Michael, please go ahead. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I just need to um, make sure my system's working. Um, do you have that on the screen there now? Can somebody just confirm that you can see my yes. slide? Yes, we can see your slide. Yes, we can. Ah, terrific. Thank you. All right, just very quickly, EnergyWise uh, has taken a slightly different view. Um, the presentations that we've had to this point have been fantastic um, and demonstrate much of the need. We've looked at it, uh, I guess we've gone back slightly into the, uh, into the background a little in order to uh, look at it because for the last 14 years we've been involved in helping people reduce their power consumption. Uh, it's very common for us to be able to find 25 to 35 percent reduction in power consumption. Uh, this is really important because what it provides is the opportunity for the current grid to its lifespan to be extended significantly longer. Uh, so by decreasing the consumption of any given uh, client, we can then uh, add more stability to the existing grid. Uh, so there's a couple of examples up on the screen of things that we've done over a period of time that, that help achieve that. What applies at the local level for households and businesses can then be um, effectively shown directly across the entire grid. If you can show consistently and particularly if governments are willing to support energy efficiency that will enable a 30% a, a reduction in power consumption, you make enormous gains to the, uh, the grid. In Australia, we've already had to do that in a number of areas. Um, and one of the areas has been by quite literally taking entire regions off of the grid entirely. Western Australia has done so um, and is, is increasingly removing existing uh, participants from the grid and sending them into microgrid uh, systems. This, this has a huge impact. In Queensland, for example, batteries are being used, large storage batteries are being used on uh, single wire earth return lines in order to enable those batteries to triple charge during low periods and provide much higher peak distribution than would ordinarily be capable of occurring on a single wire earth return line. Again, it simply means that the localized grid asset is able to, its life is extended by a significant period. As has already been pointed out, the uh, grids are coming under increasing pressure uh, and we know that Asia, for example, has now uh, gained the distinction of the fastest growth in air conditioning units worldwide. Uh, we expect to see an increase of 40% worldwide by 2030. If ordinary air conditioners are used in this process, it's going to put a, a massive strain on the grid. But there are ways around this. And as, as, uh, as nations become wealthier, 
And as our power increases, we need to have good methods to not destroy or, or overstress grids. Some practical and cost effective solutions to achieve this include solar air conditioners with batteries, for example. Uh, we've been researching and come up with some excellent solar air conditioners that create virtually no strain whatsoever on the grid at all. Uh, in Australia, the times at which we see the grid fail is on the hottest days when everybody turns on a standard air conditioner. The effect of that is, is massive. If governments were to either mandate or incentivise the use of solar connected air conditioners, which, and there are two varieties that uh, we have access to. One is a, uh, a grid connected one, but it only uses grid of an evening after the sun's gone down. The other kind uses nothing of the grid at all. It's uh, solar panels connected with batteries. It's a, its own off-grid uh, system, not even connected to the grid at all. So the net result of, of that alone over the next decade, in place of grid connected air conditioners, will alleviate massive problems that the grid will face if that doesn't occur. The other side of it is to uh, more aggressively adopt the standards that most countries have already signed up to. Most countries have already determined that uh, the use of hydrofluorocarbon refrigerants is extremely bad for the atmosphere. Despite that, there are uh, some of the biggest players in the hydrofluorocarbon industry uh, producing less damaging um, gases, but they are still well in excess of 700, 770 um, to 1 ratio of global warming potential. These can be replaced with a pure hydrocarbon refrigerant. The, the net result of this is an instantaneous 25 to 35 percent less energy consumed than the identical model using hydrofluorocarbon. Apart from the fact that it dramatically reduces the issue of uh, global warming uh, potential and, uh, and, and helps uh, benefit the atmosphere, it has the secondary benefit of consuming vastly less energy and therefore being much more effective for the grid. If you combine the, uh, the hydrocarbon refrigerant with a solar air conditioner, then you minimise the amount of solar and batteries needed to achieve the same result and you have no impact whatsoever. We've tended towards distributed battery and solar so solutions for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, as you've seen from uh, some of our other speakers, they can be used to create virtual power plants. They dramatically reduce the demand on the grid. Solar on top of a home or a building immediately decreases the power consumption required to cool because it creates a tropical roof of shade over the top of the building. Very importantly, it enhances personal, regional and national security. The, the centralised grid system is, is actually fraught with danger. Uh, I could quite literally, if I had 12 people of a, of a destructive mind, each armed um, with a $100 hire tool, could bring Australia to its knees by simply disrupting the, all of the, uh, the regional distribution system by, by cutting through the legs of a few towers and it, it would literally devastate Australia. So when you when you distribute the power and provide battery and solar or wind solutions to businesses and homes in a widespread manner, you immediately make the grid vastly more resilient and you dramatically add to national security. It also reduces the risk for catastrophic emergencies, whether that be uh, tsunamis, bushfires or uh, earthquakes. One of the other 
matters about it is that mega batteries are realistically the scope of only very, very large corporations, the likes of Elon Musk and people similar. But when you start talking about small distributed battery and, and solar systems, for example, suddenly thousands of businesses within Malaysia can be involved. Tens of thousands of workers can have jobs. It keeps the expenditure within the local economy to a much, much larger scale. So the, the impact, the social impact of distributed small-scale battery and solar systems on homes and businesses has a vastly more beneficial impact on the entire economy of the, of the nation. Furthermore, it means that uh, government funds in most instances are not required to be pushed into these areas to achieve the same results. The off-grid distributed battery and solar offers uh, zero distribution and generation costs to the uh, country, doesn't add any pressure to the electricity grids. What's more, it can be achieved with extra low voltage DC, which in Regional areas and, and areas that don't have access to local electricians means that local DIY people can achieve the results. Uh, it can be up for low power and can start up virtually anywhere and is totally scalable. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the presentation uh, and also for the um, the key things about the implementation of the um, battery and things like this. Um, are you, are you, it seems that there's a lot of background music from the side. So, <laughs> anyhow, now we move on. Yes, I'm, sorry? I'm sorry about that. I'm uh, I'm having to operate from a, uh, a cafeteria in Brisbane because I had a previous engagement that couldn't be changed. Oh dear, okay, That's, that, that explains it then. All right, thank you very much. Okay. okay then everyone that uh, that we get completes our first part of the uh, webinar now we'll move on to our second part of the webinar right the panel session so together with the four earlier speakers and we'd like to, which we invite again um to to the, to the panel we also like to invite irts dr wan shakira dr wan abdullah or dr shah who is currently the head of business assessment and engineering at tnb renewables in the Berhad. Uh, the current portfolio covers international, local, energy-related business development, focusing on global energies uh, such as uh, or including solar, wind, mini hydro, biogas, biomass, waste energy, energy storage, and virtual power. Basically, everything under the sun that is currently known as renewable energy. So we're happy to have you with us, Dr. Shah. And to moderate this session, we have a guest uh, moderator, Mr. Brandon Norman, founder and CEO of Hydrogen Fuel Cell Electric Vehicle Company H2X. That's based in Australia and currently has significant operations in Sarawak, Malaysia. So I'll hand these, uh, the proceedings then to Brandon. Go ahead, Brandon. The floor is yours. Thank you, Amran, and thank you, everyone, for paying um, attention. Uh, we're going to run through this a little bit quicker, and I'll change the order of the questions. Um, so let me jump right into it. So there's a number of opportunities for revenue and cost savings that have been identified for energy storage management of the meter. Things like frequency regulation, demand change management, arbitrage and anti ancillary services. How do you see that these opportunities will develop and what might arise with changes in market rules and regulations? Perhaps Dr. Shah, you have some ideas on, on this side of it? Um, all right, thank you, thank you, moderator. Uh, thank you, everyone, in the call today. Um, I would like to touch a bit on the question posted just now, where we can see that energy storage actually has a lot of potential to serve the grid, as you rightly pointed just now, can uh, can address the frequency regulation, uh, the spinning reserve issues, and etc. Uh, it's just that in Malaysia, uh, the current regulatory setup uh, is is not fully liberalized, that we can see that this energy storage um, cannot fully be deployed with the right revenue stream. Um, so compared to Australia, we can see that Australia are in, in a market base, which uh, there has been a clear, clear revenue streams for this energy storage to be deployed. 
So, so that's that's the current situation in Malaysia. But we hope that the regulatory environment in Malaysia will evolve uh, to cater the deployment, bigger deployment of energy storage uh, in Malaysia uh, to help the grid on the grid side and also uh, behind the meter side. Yep. Thank you on that. Okay. Perfect. Um, Nick Smith, do you have any ideas on that one as well? from your experience with Australia? Yeah, look, I think it's a, it's a really interesting one in terms of, um, you know, batteries can provide so much more than just frequency control or energy arbitrage. And I, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's about rewarding market participants for the services that they can provide. And I think that that's the really critical thing because then, then you actually create a value stream which, in, which encourages the investment. And, you know, what, what we're seeing is in, you know, particularly behind the meter, um, you know, the government's got, um, you know, one of the world's largest um, rollouts of home batteries per, per capita. If you can aggregate those into virtual power plants and combine that with solar, then, you know, in, in South Australia, the, the solar that we have on our rooftops is, is you know, the largest generator. It's nearly two gigawatts of, of generation and it's all distributed. So if you can actually put that in with batteries and, and you know, you can load shift and you can re reduce your peaks, you, ca you can reduce the amount of augmentation that needs to go into the network, particularly Particularly now, you know, once upon a time we were, you know, we were just would generate in, in a central location and would radiate it out. Um, now we've got bi-directional flows, and I think that that you know the ability to to use batteries as a as a mechanism of solar soaking and and reducing the the, the investment that's required by the distribution and transmission network that actually it benefits all consumers. So those are the sorts of things that need to be taken into account when developing sort of, you know, cost, cost profiles and regulations uh, in terms of what are the true benefits to consumers. Yeah, perfect. Dr. Meng, do you have any ideas on that from your point of view, from what you've researched from the university? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, that's an interesting topic. Um, from, personally, I think the market for the uh, frequency regulation uh, first one is not driven by the growth of um, electrical demand, but rather than the fluctuation in the frequency, which is caused by the generation and the, and uh, or, or can say it's imbalance between generation and the demand. So this means there may be, I would say, there may be relatively limited opportunity for FCAS provider to um, to cash in high prices in long term, especially we have large number of new entrants like big batteries, they're trying to step into this market. This is going to definitely absorb a large portion of the um, FCAS opportunities going forward. And uh, But personally, from from academic perspective, I think the value of uh, FCAS from the battery sometimes is quite difficult to, I mean, to, to estimate the number without doing some of the complex modelings from, this is my, my, my opinion. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So given all of that complexity, uh, is there any, um, in terms of optimising the way energy storage, the size, the location, the, the methodology, are there any modelling softwares or things like this that the developers can use to sort of make this all work? Michael, are there some things that you've seen that might be able to work in that regard? You're on mute, Michael. Still on mute. There you go. How's that working? Better. My apologies. We've we've developed small scale systems using uh, Excel for small communities and individuals to be able to use. Uh, but to be honest with you, I was very impressed with the uh, software that Dr. K showed us for larger Microsoft systems. I'm um, sorry, larger microgrid systems. I think I think he's absolutely in the in the right direction for providing that kind of support for mid and large scale micro generation. Is that uh, uh, something that's available to the public, Dr. Meng? Is that how you see that product going? Is that a product as such even? Yeah. So this is a product we have developed. Uh, through many years of research with the fundings from the government and also the our industry partners. Yeah, so this is a tool um, which can available for the um, system planner 
for designers. We also we also developing another tool for larger scale like uh, battery storage or can say the hardware PV based system. So um, as I said, so an another analysis of these like revenues and costs, we need to do some kind of uh, complex modeling. So especially when we see um, um, there are lots of examples like large scale, like we have the AC cap port, we have DC cap port. So um, of course, sometimes we can we, we increase the um, the cost of the system, but sometimes we can reduce uh, the overall. Um, obviously, it's, um, increase the overall efficiency. Okay, perfect. So Amir, if we look at your product, how would you look at approaching the customers? with an idea of being able to provide the um, economics of the benefits of your product, for example, in context, context of what we've just discussed with Michael and Dr. Meng. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, our solution is viable in combination uh, with, the, uh, with the lithium ion battery storage, but uh, it, it, it complements actually where, you know, for the long duration um, and uh, where long duration more than six hours or even longer uh, duration is required. And the other, um, we we haven't uh, looked into. I mean, m uh, my team members would have definitely looked into the you know um, other aspects of microgrid aspects, but uh, we are specifically looking at the duration of the storage and the benefits that metal hydride storage or hydrogen storage can provide. Uh, especially, you know, the um, I mean, lithium-ion batteries are have their own. A pros and cons. Obviously, there's a limited lifetime. There's a risk of fire. There's a limited time that they can supply to the, you know, um, to the grid and uh, to, uh, you know, for for grid security and stability. So there, there are certain limitations, and hydrogen also has certain benefits and limitations, especially the metal hydride. So um, the safety aspect is very strong in this case. Okay, not perfect. Um, another question, um, battery storage systems are increasingly being used to integrate and improve the stability of the power grid, regulating the frequencies, um, facilitating the integration of renewables into the existing power system. So how is the inoperability between these assets, the, the batteries and the existing um, assets? How is this managed and how will this go forward as we start to channel the resources better? Um, Dr. Shah, how are you treating that at TNB? Okay, um, just a bit brief on what we have now in TNB. We, we got a pilot project, uh, energy storage based virtual power plant. It's a small one, but but that is uh, where we want to test um, whether it is doable or not in, in our market. So we are also testing it to be connected to our grid system operator and how this energy storage can respond to the system. So um, at this point of time, we can say that technically it's doable, uh, meaning that um, it is always possible to connect and to connect and to operate this energy storage um, to serve the grid uh, services. But the hurdle now is on the economics uh, and how the revenue streams are, are, are carefully calculated and um, and paid to the uh, individual energy storage uh, for this kind of services. So compared to Australia, probably we are a bit, uh, a bit uh, lagging in terms of uh, development. Um, we are still on the piloting stage. And we really hope that uh, this kind of technology can be deployed in a larger scale in the future. So, so appreciate the collaboration or uh, communication and discussion in the future with our esteemed uh, Australian colleagues uh, for, for this purpose. Okay, perfect. No, that's, um, it's, it's a great challenge, but it's also a very interesting one as well. Uh, we're yeah. very short on time. We've just got one question that's come from the audience from Afika, who's the lead office from MPRC for Innovation and Technology. Um, for, for Dr. Meng, um, just in relation to the microgrid, uh, has the project been done with any oil and gas companies and how could they potentially be involved? And what's just a little bit more on the status of that? Yeah, so um, 
we currently we're working with many farmers in New South Wales to so help them to design a microgrid. So most of these farmers are actually sitting at the edge of the grid. Sometimes they have the network constraints and also another one is because of the increasing of electricity price. So um, we, we designed the market grid for a large number of farmers in New South Wales. And also um, we, we also help the local government to design the um, Huntley market grid system, which is 50 megawatt system. So in terms of the uh, oil and the mining industries, we, we haven't stepped into this area, but happy to help if there are any questions or issues is Michael Green. Okay, perfect. And I think that probably rounds out our timing. Um, so let me hand it back to, um, let me hand it back to um, our leader, uh, Amran, for um, closing us off. Okay, thank you very much, Brandon, and all the panelists uh, for the, I mean, it was, sorry, it's a short panelist session, but at least it covered a lot of things, I think, from the, from an aspect of what we uh, wanted to cover for this time. Thank you very much. So now we move on to the next item of agenda with just a few more items left before we close for today. I can see that Puan Sharifa has already switched on the camera. So I would like now to present, uh, invite Puan Sharifa to offer her closing remarks to our webinar. Let's see you again, Puan. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and a very good afternoon to all MOXIE members, all straight members, attendees at today's webinar listening to the application of battery storage systems from the Australian experience organised by the MOXIE Alternative Energy Working Group in conjunction with Austrade. I, I, I apologize, Brandon, that was a very interesting panel session and I wish it could go on longer. Maybe we should actually organize another one. Um, and I was talking to Amran whilst you were moderating and it was fantastic moderation, uh, by the way, um, that, you know, half of the things that was being said was probably very technical and uh, I, me and Amran probably will have to actually read more to understand. It's that, uh, as Amran was saying, it's a totally different branch of energy by itself. So, um, MOXIE through the Alternative Energy Working Group aims to support the Malaysian oil and gas and industry uh, transition to the new energy future. So, in this regard, we have been setting our sights globally to identify best practices and partnerships opportunities. And we are very glad to work with the team at Austrid, Juliana, to bring you this webinar on the battery energy storage systems. And from what I understand, uh, from the sem this webinar, um, I think we are a little bit we lagging in terms of this technology, and we hope that we can learn more about it to actually jump jump start our, not jump start, but you know um, uh, ex accelerate our uh, our feasibility to actually have those in Malaysia soon. So. Having said that, that was this has been a truly insightful discussion with an esteemed panel of experts sharing their insights and outlook on this technology. And Australia and Malaysia have long-standing partnerships in the energy industry. Australia, similar to Malaysia, is rich in oil and gas resources and is charting its own path in the transition towards renewables. And I was quite um, excited to see that you know you will be reaching 100% renewable by 2030, and that's only like eight years go. Well, that's fantastic. Through dialogues such as this, there is much that we can learn from each other and work together towards a low carbon energy future. I would like to thank Mr. Paul Sander and his team from Austria for collaborating with us on this event. Uh, thank you to all the panel esteemed speakers for bringing us the new perspective on battery energy storage systems. And as always, appreciation to the Alternative Energy Working Group chaired by Inche Amran and Mr. Mohan and Anna together with your team. And of course, Juliana from Austria supported by Moxie Secretariat led by Rohazli and Sophia. Well done, everyone. It was a fantastic webinar. Do join a little bit of marketing here. Do join the Moxie Alternative Working Group, Energy Working Group, or join our next working group meeting if you are interested. There is much that we can share and collaborate and um, and 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 bring new technologies to Malaysia uh, during the discussion in our like-minded group. We will email a meeting notice when the next meeting is planned. And if you're not on our, on our email list and have not been receiving our email blast, do let the secretary know and we can add you on our email database. Um, uh, just to remind that Moxie have proven to be a beneficial platform with 400 
plus event completed to bring you latest news information and voice for our industry and if you're unsure of your membership status you can contact the secretariat and for those who are not moxie members i highly encourage your company to join moxie as a member whether as a corporate or an affiliate this the fees are superbly reasonable to the value add that we bring do get in touch with the secretariat on how to register as a member and do follow us on our moxie social media accounts as latest information are regularly shared on our linkedin facebook and instagram accounts other than our website thank you again everyone thank you to the esteemed panel uh, panel who who have given some insights and it was really interesting to listen to the webinar thank you very much and back to you amran thank you very much Juan, uh, for the very welcome well, it sounds more like a welcoming remark right now. <laughs> <laughs> so thank everyone, you <laughs> so everyone thank you very much we've come to the uh, just one more step before we say bye bye to everyone now we have this uh, our typical or our usual uh, photography session so I just <laughs> like everyone to switch on your cameras and uh, smile for the camera i'll uh, let uh, the Moxie Secretary decide on when we are good to good to go. All right, uh, Sophia or Raimi, please uh, let us know. Okay, when we're supposed to smile and uh, show thumbs up, whatever. <laughs> and everyone else, please uh, please do kindly switch on your cameras if you'd like to have your picture taken. Then. Thank you very much. And you can see yourselves in the next newsletter. <laughs> yes. We publish newsletter on a weekly basis. All right, ready, everyone. One, two, three. Uh, thumbs up. Thumbs up, okay. <laughs> thumbs up <Right>. or freestyle. <laughs> Ready. For the old timers, it's thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. We should forward. organize more of this because it's really, really has been insightful. I think a bit longer, yeah, Amran? Yeah, now that we know what what can be can be dis can be shared, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. And they, I mean, they, they they've seen that there's a lot of interest at, le at least from the attendees mm. as well. Those maybe not many questions, but there's a lot of attendees in our webinar session. And maybe so we can get Doctor. Maybe maybe we can get Doctor Shah to actually have a small presentation on where we are um, in the energy storage, you know, in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Doctor Shah, boleh ya? Inshallah. You're really putting a spot. Uh, we'll get in touch with her soon. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you, everybody. So just before we close and say bye-bye and we'll move on to the next items on our agenda for the day, uh, please do scan the QR code to send us your feedback. Right, Feedback is a breakfast of champion, as some people say. So this is a way of how we can improve our webinars for the future and also collect your feedback. Uh, with regards to how this particular session went. Without, uh, and with that, then thank you very much, everyone. Thank you the, for all speakers who had kindly taken, uh, given the time right, to come and uh, share with us their experiences and their insights. Uh, thank you to Austrade, Mr. Paul Sander and uh, his team. And thank you to the MOXIE uh, Secretariat and the, especially my wonderful team uh, at the Alternative Energy Working Group. And finally, to our mentor, who has been very supportive with respect to what we plan to do for this uh, alternative energy working group. So without uh, so with that then thank you very much and have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Great pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Mr. Aran. Well done. Thanks. Thanks.